War on Bear Creek by Robert Howard. Pap dug the nineteenth buckshot out of my shoulder and said, Pigs is more disturbing to the peace of a community than scandal, divorce, and corn liquor put together. And, says Pap, pausing to strop his buoy on my scalp where the hair was all burnt off, when the pig is a razorback hog and is mixed up with a lady school teacher, an English tenderfoot, and a passel of bloodthirsty relatives, the result is a Hauling for a peaceable man to behold. Hold still till John gets your ears sewed back on. Pap was right. I weren't to blame for what happened. Breaking Joel Gordon's leg was a mistake, and Erath Elkins is a liar when he says I caved in them five ribs of his'n plum on purpose. If Uncle Jeopard Grimes had been tending to his own business, he wouldn't have got the seat of his breeches filled with buckshot, and I don't figure it was my fault that Cousin Bill Kirby's cabin got burned down, and I don't take no blame for Jim Gordon's ear, which Jack Grimes shot off neither. I figure everybody was more to blame than I was, and I stand ready to wipe up the earth with anybody which disagrees with me. But it was that dern razorback hog of Uncle Jeffrey Grimes which started the whole mess. It begun when that there tenderfoot come riding up the trail with Tunk Willoughby from War Paint. Now Tunk ain't got no more sense than the law allows, but he sure showed good judgment that time, because having delivered his charge to his destination, he didn't tarry. He merely handed me a note and pinted dumbly at the tenderfoot, whilst holding his hat reverently in his hand, meanwhile. "'What do you mean by that there gesture?' I asked him rather irritably, and he says, "'I doss my sombrero in respect to the departed. Bringing a specimen like that on the Bear Creek is just like heaving a jackrabbit to a pack of starving lobos.' He hove a sigh and shook his head, and put his hat back on. "'Rassle a cat in pieces,' he said, gathering up the reins. "'What the hell are you talking about?' I demanded. "'That's Latin,' he said. "'It means rest in peace.' And with that he dusted it down the trail, and left me alone with the tenderfoot, which all the time was setting his cayuse and looking at me like I was a curiosity or something. I called my sister, Washita, to come and read that there note for me, which she did, and it run as follows. Dear Breckenridge, this will introduce Mr. Pembroke Pemberton, a English sportsman which I met in Frisco recent. He was disappointed because he hadn't found no adventures in America, and was fixin' to go to Africa to shoot lions and elephants but I persuaded him to come with me because I knowed he would find more hell on Bear Creek in a week than he would find in a year in Africa or any other place. But the very day we hit war paint, I run into an old acquaintance from Texas. I will not speak no harm of the dead, but I wish the son of a buzzard had shot me somewheres besides in my left leg which already had three slugs in it which I never could get cut out. Anyway, I am laid up and not able to come on to Bear Creek with J. Pembroke Pemberton. I am dependent on you to show him some good bear hunting and other excitement, and protect him from your relatives. I know what an uh, awful responsibility I am putting on you, but I am asking this as your friend, William Harrison Glanton, Esquire. I looked J. Pembroke over. He was a medium-sized young feller and looked kind of soft in spots. He had yeller hair and very pink cheeks like a gal, and he had on whipcord breeches and tan riding boots, which was the first I ever seen, and he had on a funny kind of coat with pockets and a belt, which he called a shooting jacket and a big hat like a mushroom made out of cork with a red ribbon around it. And he had a pack-horse loaded with all kinds of plunder, 
and four or five different kinds of shotguns and rifles. So you're J. Pembroke, I says, and he says, Oh, rather, and you no doubt are the person Mr. Clanton described to me, Breckenridge Elkins? Yeah, I said, light and come on in. We got bar meat and honey for supper. I say, he said, climbing down, pardon me for being a bit personal, old chap, but may I ask if your, um, magnitude of bodily stature is not a bit unique? I don't know, I says, not having the slightest idea what he was talking about. I always votes a straight democratic ticket myself. He started to say something else, but just then, Pap and my brothers John and Bill and Jim and Buckner and Garfield come to the door to see what the noise was about, and he turned pale and said faintly, I beg your pardon. Giants seem to be the rule in these parts. Pap says men ain't what they was when he was in his prime, I said, but we managed to get by. Well, J. Pembroke laid into them bar stakes with a hearty will, and when I told him we'd go after bar next day, he asked me how many days travel it'd take till we got to the bar country. Heck, I said, you don't have to travel to get bar in these parts. If you forget to bolt your door at night, you're liable to find a grizzly share in your bunk before morning. This herein we're eatin' was catched by my sister Ellen there, whilst trying to rob the pig pen out behind the cabin last night. My word, he says, looking at her peculiarly, and may I ask, Miss Elkins, what caliber of firearm you used? I knocked him in the head with a wagon tongue, she said, and he shook his head to himself and muttered, Extraordinary. J. Pembroke slept in my bunk, and I took the floor that night, and we was up at daylight and ready to start after the bar. Whilst J. Pembroke was fussing over his guns, Pap came out and pulled his whiskers and shook his head and said, That there is a perlite young man, but I'm afeard he ain't as hale as he ought to be. I'd just give him a pull at my jug, and he didn't gulp but one good snort and like to choke to death. Well, I said, buckling the cinches on Captain Kidd, I've done learned not to judge outsiders by the way they takes their liquor on Bear Creek. It takes a Bear Creek man to swig Bear Creek corn juice. I hopes for the best, sighed Pap, but it's a dismal sight to see a young man which can't stand up to his liquor. Where you taking him? Over toward Apache Mountain, I said. Erath seen an extra big grizzly over there day before yesterday. Hmm, says Pap. By peculiar coincidence, the schoolhouse is over on the side of Apache Mountain, ain't it, Breckenridge? Maybe it is, and maybe it ain't, I replied with dignity, and rode off with J. Pembroke, ignoring Pap's sarcastic comment, which he hollered after me. Maybe they's a connection between book learning and bar hunting, but who am I to say? J. Pembroke was a pretty good rider, but he used a funny-looking saddle without no horn nor cantle, and he had the derndest gun I ever seen. It was a double-barreled rifle, and he said it was an elephant gun. It was big enough to knock a hill down. He was surprised I didn't tote no rifle and asked me what would I do if we met a bar. I told him I was dependent on him to shoot it, but I said if it was necessary for me to get into action, my six-shooter was plenty. My word, says he, you mean to say you can bring down a grizzly with a shot from a pistol? Not always, I said. Sometimes I have to bust him over the head with a butt to finish him. He didn't say nothing for a long time after that. Well, we rode over on the lower slopes of Apache Mountain and tied the horses in a holler and went through the brush on foot. That was a good place for bars because they come there very frequently looking for Uncle Jeopard Grimes' pigs which runs loose all over the lower slopes of the mountain. But just like it always is when you're looking for something, we didn't see a cussed bar. The middle of the evening, 
found us around on the south side of the mountain where they is a settlement of Kirby's and Grimes's and Gordon's. Half a dozen family has their cabins within a mile of each other, and I don't know what in hell they want to crowd up together that way for. It would plumb smother me. But Pap says they was always peculiar that way. We weren't in sight of the settlement, but the schoolhouse weren't far off, and I said to Jay Pembroke, you wait here a while, and maybe a bar'll come by. Miss Margaret Ashley is teaching me how to read and write, and it's time for my lesson. I left J. Pembroke setting on a log, hugging his elephant gun, and I strode through the brush and came out at the upper end of the run, which the settlement was at the other one, and school had just turned out, and the children was going home, and Miss Ashley was waiting for me in the log schoolhouse. That was the first school that was ever taught on Bear Creek, and she was the first teacher. Some of the folks was awful sought again it at first, and said no good would come a book learning. But after I licked six or seven of them, they allowed it might be a good thing after all, and agreed to let her take a whack at it. Miss Margaret was an awful purty gal, and come from somewhere away back east. She was settin' at her handmade desk as I come in, ducking my head so as to not bump it again the top of the door, and politely taking off my coonskin cap. She looked kind of tired and discouraged, and I said, Has a young'un's been raising any hell today, Miss Margaret? Oh, no, she said. They're very polite. In fact, I've noticed that Bear Creek people are always polite except when they're killing each other. I've finally gotten used to the boys wearing their bowie knives and pistols to school, but somehow it seems so futile. This is all so terribly different from everything to which I've always been accustomed. I get discouraged and feel like giving up. Oh, you'll get used to it, I consoled her. It'll be a lot different once you're married to some honest, reliable young man. She gave me a startled look and said, Married to someone here on Bear Creek? Sure, I said, involuntarily expanding my chest under my buckskin shirt. Everybody's just wondering when you'll set the date. But let's get at the lesson. I'd done learnt the words you writ out for me yesterday. But she weren't listening, and she said, Do you have any idea why Mr. Joel Grimes and Mr. Esau Gordon quit calling on me? Until a few days ago, one or the other was at Mr. Kirby's cabin where I board almost every night. Now don't you worry none about them, I soothed her. Joel'll be about on crutches before the week's out, and Esau can already walk without being helped. I always handles my relatives as easy as possible. You fought with them, she exclaimed. I just convinced them you didn't want to be bothered with them, I reassured her. I'm easy going, but I don't like competition. Competition? Her eyes flared wide open and she looked at me like she never seen me before. Do you mean that you, that I, that, well, I said modestly, everybody on Bear Creek is just wondering when you're going to set the day for us to get hitched. You see, gals don't stay single very long in these parts, and, hey, what's the matter? Because she was getting paler and paler, like she'd et something which didn't agree with her. Nothing, she said faintly. You, you mean people are expecting me to marry you? Sure, I said. She muttered something that sounded like, my God and licked her lips with her tongue and looked at me like she was about ready to faint. Well, it ain't every gal which has a chance to get hitched to Breckenridge Elkins, so I didn't blame her for being excited. You've been very kind to me, Breckenridge, she said feebly, but I... this is so sudden, so unexpected. I, I never thought, I never dreamed. Oh, I don't want to rush you, I said. Take your time. Next week will be soon enough. Anyway, I gotta build us a cabin and bang went a gun. Too loud for a Winchester. Elkins! It was J. Pembroke yelling for me up the slope. Elkins! Hurry! Who's that? she exclaimed, jumping to her feet like she was working on a spring. Oh, I said in disgust, it's a fool tenderfoot Bill Glanton wished on me. 
I reckon a bar has got him by the neck. I'll go see. I'll go with you, she said. But from the way Pembroke was yelling, I figured I'd better not waste no time getting to him. So I couldn't wait for her, and she was some piece behind me when I mounted the lap of the slope and met him running out from amongst the trees. He was gibbering with excitement. I winged it, he squawked. I'm sure I winged the blighter, but it ran in amongst the underbrush, and I dared not follow it, for the beast is most vicious when wounded. A friend of mine once wounded one in South Africa, and a bar, I asked. No, no, he said, a wild boar, the most vicious brute I have ever seen. It ran into that brush there. Oh, there ain't no wild boars in the Humboldts, I snorted. You wait here. I'll go see just what you did shoot. I seen some splashes of blood on the grass, so I knowed he'd shot something. Well, I hadn't gone more than a few hundred feet and was just out of sight of Jay Pembroke when I run into Uncle Jefford Grimes. Uncle Jefford was one of the first white men to come into the Humboldts. He's as lean and hard as a pine knot and wears fringed buckskins and moccasins just like he done fifty years ago. He had a bowie knife in one hand, and he waved something in the other and like a flag of revolt, and he was frothing at the mouth. The darn murderer, he howled. You see this? That's the tale of Daniel Webster, the finest darn razorback boar which ever trod the Humboldts. That dang tenderfoot of yearn tried to kill him, shot his tail off right spang up to the hilt. He can't mutilate my animals like this. I'll have his heart's blood. And he done a war dance, waving that pigtail in his buoy and cussing in English and Spanish and Apache engine all at once. You calm down, Uncle Jeopard, I said sternly. He ain't got no sense, and he thought Daniel Webster was a wild boar, like they have in Africa and England and them foreign places. He didn't mean no harm. No harm, said Uncle Jefford fiercely, and Daniel Webster with no more tail on to him than a jackrabbit. Well, I said, here's a five-dollar gold piece to pay for the darn hog's tail, and you let J. Pembroke alone. Gold can't satisfy honor, he said bitterly, but nevertheless grabbing the coin like a starving man grabbing a beefsteak. I'll let this outrage pass for the time, but I'll be watching that maniac to see that he don't mutilate no more of my prize razorbacks. And so saying, he went off, muttering in his beard. I went back to where I left J. Pembroke, and there he was talking to Miss Margaret, which had just come up. She had more color in her face than I'd saw recent. Fancy meeting a girl like you here, J. Pembroke was saying. No more surprising than meeting a man like you, says she, with a kind of fluttery laugh. Oh, a sportsman wanders into all sorts of out-of-the-way places, says he. And seeing they hadn't noticed me coming up, I says, Well, J. Pembroke, I didn't find your wild boar, but I met the owner. He looked at me kind of blank and said vaguely, Wild boar? What wild boar? That and you shot the tail off of with that there fool elephant gun, I says. Listen, next time you see a hog critter, you remember there ain't no wild boars in the Humboldts. They is craters called Haverleaners in South Texas, but they ain't even none of them in Nevada. So next time you see a hog, just reflect that it's merely one of Uncle Jeopard Grimes's razorbacks and refrain from shooting at it. Oh, quite he agreed absently, and started talking to Miss Margaret again. So I picked up the elephant gun, which he'd absent-mindedly laid down, and said, Well, it's getting late. Let's go. We won't get back to Pap's cabin tonight, J. Pembroke. We'll stay at Uncle Saul Garfield's cabin on t'other side of Apache Mountain Settlement. As I said, then cabins was awful close together. Uncle Saul's cabin was below the settlement, but it weren't much over three hundred yards from Cousin Bill Kirby's cabin, where Miss Margaret boarded. The other cabins was on t'other side of Bill's, mostly, strung out up the run and up and down the slopes. I told J. Pembroke and Miss Margaret to walk on down to the settlement whilst I went back and got the horses. They'd got to the settlement time I catched up with them, and Miss Margaret had gone into the Kirby cabin, and I seen a light spring up in her room. 
She had one of them new-fangled aisle lamps she brung with her, the only one on Bear Creek. Candles and pine chunks was good enough for us folks, and she'd hanged rag things over the winders, which she called curtains. You never seen nothing like it. I tell you, she was that elegant you wouldn't believe it. We walked on toward Uncle Saul's, me leading the horses, and after a while Jay Pembroke says, A wonderful creature. You mean Daniel Webster? I asked. No, he said. No, no. I mean Miss Ashley. She sure is, I said. She'll make me a fine wife. He whirled like I'd stabbed him, and his face looked pale in the dusk. You, he said. You a wife? Well, I said bashfully, she ain't sought the day yet, but I've sure sought my heart on that gal. Oh, he says. Oh, says he, like he had the toothache. Then he said, kind of hesitatingly, suppose, er, just suppose, you know, suppose a rival for her affection should appear. What would you do? You mean, if some dirty, low-down son of a mangy skunk was trying to steal my gal, I said, whirling so sudden he staggered backwards. Steal my gal? I roared, seeing red at the mere thought. Why, I'd, I'd, words failing me, I wheeled and grabbed a good-sized saplin and tore it up by the roots and broke it across my knee and throwed the pieces clean through a rail fence on the other side of the road. That there is a faint ID, I said, panting with passion. That gives me a very good conception, he said faintly, and he said nothing more till we reached the cabin and seen Uncle Saul Garfield standing in the light of the door, combing his black beard with his fingers. Next morning, J. Pembroke seemed like he'd kind of lost interest in bars. He said all that walking he'd done over the slopes of Apache Mountain had made his leg muscles sore. I never heard of such a thing, but nothing that gets the matter with these tender feet surprises me much. They is such a effeminate race. So I asked him would he like to go fishing down the run. He said all right. But we hadn't been fishing more than an hour when he said he believed he'd go back to Uncle Saul's cabin and take him a nap and he insisted on going alone, so I stayed where I was and catch me a nice string of trout. I went back to the cabin about noon and asked Uncle Saul if J. Pembroke had got his nap out. Why, heck, said Uncle Saul, I ain't seen him since you and him started down the run this morning. Wait a minute, yonder he comes from the other direction. Well, J. Pembroke didn't say where he'd been all morning, and I didn't ask him, because a tenderfoot don't generally have no reason for anything he does. We ate the trout I catched, and after dinner he perked up a right smart and got a shotgun and said he'd like to hunt some wild turkeys. I never heard of anybody hunting anything as big as a turkey with a shotgun, but I didn't say nothing, because tenderfeet is like that. So we headed up the slopes of Apache Mountain, and I stopped by the schoolhouse to tell Miss Margaret I probably wouldn't get back in time to take my reading and writing lesson. And she said, You know, until I met your friend, Mr. Pembroke, I didn't realize what a difference there was between men like him and, well, like the men on Bear Creek. I know, I said, but don't hold it again him. He means well. He just ain't got no sense. Everybody can't be smart like me. As a special favor to me, Miss Margaret, I'd like for you to be extra nice to the poor sap because he's a friend of my friend, Bill Glanton, down to Warpaint. I will, Brackenridge, she replied heartily, and I thanked her and went away with my big manly heart pounding in my gigantic bosom. Me and J. Pembroke headed into the heavy timber, and we hadn't went far till I was convinced that somebody was following us. I kept hearing twigs snapping, and once I thought I seen a shadowy figure duck behind a bush. But when I run back there it was gone, and no track to show in the pine needles. That sort of thing would have made me nervous anywhere else, because they is an awful lot of people which would like to get a clean shot at my back from the brush, but I knowed none of them dast come after me in my own territory. If anybody was trailing us, it was bound to be one of my relatives, 
and to save my neck, I couldn't think of no reason why any one of them would be gunning for me. But I got tired of it, and left Jay Pembroke in a small glade while I snuck back to do some shattering of my own. I aimed to cast a big circle around the opening and see if I could find out who it was. But I'd hardly got out of sight of Jay Pembroke when I heard a gun bang. I turned to run back, and here come Jay Pembroke yelling, I got him! I got him! I winged the Bali Aborigine! He had his head down as he busted through the brush, and he run into me in his excitement and hit me in the belly with his head so hard he bounced back like a rubber ball and landed in a bush with his riding boots brandishing wildly in the air. Assist me, Breckenridge, he shrieked. Extricate me. They will be hot on our trail. Who, I demanded, hauling him out by the hind leg and setting him on his feet. The Indians, he hollered jumping up and down and waving his smoking shotgun frantically. The Bally Redskins! I shot one of them. I saw him sneaking through the bushes. I saw his legs. I know it was an Indian because he had on moccasins instead of boots. Listen, that's him now. An Indian couldn't cuss like that, I said. You've shot Uncle Jeopard Grimes. Telling him to stay there, I run through the brash, guided by the maddened howls which riz horribly on the air, and busting through some bushes I seen Uncle Jeppard rolling on the ground with both hands clasped to the rear bosom of his buckskin breeches, which was smoking freely. His language was awful to hear. Are you in misery, Uncle Jeppard? I inquired solicitously. This evoked another ear-splitting squall. I'm writhing in my death throes, he says in horrible accents, and you stands there and mocks my mortal agony, my own blood kin, he says. Ah, 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 says Uncle Jeppard with passion. Aw, oh, I says, that there bird shot wouldn't hurt a flea. It can't be very deep under your thick old hide. Lie on your belly, Uncle Jeppard, I said, stropping my buoy on my boot, and I'll dig out them shot for you. Don't tetch me, he said fiercely, painfully climbing onto his feet. Where's my rifle gun? Give me it. Now then, I demands that you bring that English murderer here where I can get a clean lamb at him. The grime's honor is besmirched and my new breeches is ruined. Nothing but blood can wipe out the stain on the family honor. Well, I said, you hadn't no business sneaking around after us that away. Here Uncle Jeffrey give tongue to loud and painful shrieks. Why shouldn't I? he howled. Ain't a man got no right to protect his own property? I was follering him to see that he didn't shoot no more tails off of my hogs. And now he shoots me in the same place. He's a fiend in human form, a monster, with stalks ravelin' through these hills, bustin' for the blood of the innocent. Ah, Jay Pembroke thought you was an injun, I said. He thought Daniel Webster was a wild warthog, gibbered Uncle Jeppard. He thought I was Geronimo. I reckon he'll massacre the entire population of Bear Creek under a misapprehension, and you'll uphold and defend him. When the cabins of your kinfolks is smoldering ashes, smothered in the blood of your own relatives, I hope you'll be satisfied, bringing a foreign assassin into a peaceful community. Here Uncle Jeppard's emotions choked him, and he chawed his whiskers, and then yanked out the five-dollar gold piece I give him for Daniel Webster's tail, and throwed it at me. Take back your filthy lucre, he said bitterly. The day of retribution is close on to hand, Breckenridge Elkins, and the Lord of Battles shall judge between them which turns again their kinfolks in their extremities. In their which, I says, but he merely snarled and went limping off through the trees, calling back over his shoulder. They is still men on Bear Creek which will see justice did for the aged and helpless, I'll get that English murderer if it's the last thing I do, and you'll be sorry you stood up for him, you big lunkhead. 
I went back to where J. Pembroke was waiting bewilderedly, and evidently still expecting a tribe of Injuns to bust out of the brush and sculp him, and I said in disgust, Let's go home. Tomorrow I'll take you so far away from Bear Creek you can shoot in any direction without hitting a prize razorback or an antiquated gunman with an ingrown disposition. When Uncle Jeopard Grimes gets mad enough to throw away money, it's time to aisle the Winchesters and strap your scabbard ends to your legs. Legs? he said mistily. But what about the Indian? There weren't no Indian, gall darn it, I howled. They ain't been any on Bear Creek for four or five year. They, oh hell, what's the use? Come on, it's getting late. Next time you see something you don't understand, ask me before you shoot it. And remember, the more ferocious and woolly it looks, the more likely it is to be a leading citizen of Bear Creek. It was dark when we approached Uncle Saul's cabin, and J. Pembroke glanced back up the road toward the settlement and said, "'My word, is it a political rally? Look, a torchlight parade.' I looked and said, "'Quick, get in the cabin and stay there.' He turned pale and said, "'If there is danger, I insist on insist all you darn please,' I said, "'but get in that house and stay there. I'll handle this. Uncle Saul, see he gets in there.' Uncle Saul is a man of few words. He'd taken a firm grip on his pipe stem and grabbed J. Pembroke by the neck in the seat of the breeches and throwed him bodily into the cabin and shut the door and sot down on the stoop. They ain't no use in you getting mixed up in this, Uncle Saul, I said. You got your faults, Breckenridge, he grunted. You ain't got much sense, but you're my favorite sister's son and I ain't forgot that lame mule Jeppard traded me for a sound animal back in sixty-nine. Let em come. They come, all right, and surged up in front of the cabin. Jeppard's boys, Jack and Buck and Esau and Joash and Polk County, and Erath Elkins and a mob of Gordons and Buckners and Polks, all more or less kin to me, except Joe Braxton, who wasn't kin to any of us, but didn't like me because he was sweet on Miss Margaret. But Uncle Jeppard weren't with em. Some had torches, and Polk County Grimes had a rope with a noose in it. Where at air you all goin' with that there lariat? I asked them sternly, planting my enormous bulk in their path. Produce the scoundrel, said Polk County, waving his rope round his head. Bring out the foreign invader which shoots hogs and defenseless old men from the brush. What you aim to do, I inquired. We aim to hang him, they replied with hearty enthusiasm. Uncle Saul knocked the ashes out of his pipe and stood up and stretched his arms, which looked like knotted oak limbs, and he grinned in his black beard like an old timber wolf. And he says, Where is dear cousin Jeppard to speak for hisself? Uncle Jeppard was having the shot picked out of his hide when we left, says Joel Gordon. He'll be along directly. Breckenridge, we don't want no trouble with you, but we aims to have that Englishman. Well, I snorted, you all can't. Bill Glanton is trusting me to return him whole of body and limb, and what do you want to waste time and argument for, Breckenridge? Uncle Saul reproved mildly. Don't you know it's a plumb waste of time to try to reason with the offspring of a lame mule trader? What would you suggest, old man? sneeringly remarked Polk County. Uncle Saul beamed on him benevolently and said gently, I'd try moral suasion. Like this, and he hit Polk County under the jaw and knocked him clean across the yard into a rain barrel amongst the ruins of which he reposed until he was rescued and revived some hours later. But they was no stopping Uncle Saul once he took the warpath. No sooner had he disposed of Polk County than he jumped seven foot into the air, cracked his heels together three times, give the rebel yell, and come down with his arms around the necks of Esau Grimes and Joe Braxton, which he went to the earth with and started mopping up the cabin yard with them. That started the fight, and they is no scrap in the world where mayhem is committed as free and fervent as in one of these here family ruckuses. 
Polk County had hardly crashed into the rain barrel when Jack Grimes stuck a pistol in my face. I slapped it aside just as he fired, and the bullet missed me in taking an ear off of Jim Gordon. I was scared Jack would hurt somebody if he kept on shooting reckless that way, so I kind of wrapped him with my left fist, and how was I to know it would dislocate his jaw? But Jim Gordon seemed to think I was to blame about his ear, because he give a maddened howl and jerked up his shotgun and let bam with both barrels. I ducked just in time to keep from getting my head blowed off and catched most of the double charge in my shoulder, whilst the rest hived in the seat of Steve Kirby's breeches. Being shot that way by a relative was irritating, but I controlled my temper and merely taken the gun away from Jim and splintered the stock over his head. In the meantime, Joel Gordon and Buck Grimes had grabbed one of my legs apiece and was trying to wrestle me to the earth, and Joe Ash Grimes was trying to hold down my right arm, and Cousin Pecus Buckner was beating me over the head from behind with an axe handle, and Erath Elkins was coming at me from the front with a buoy knife. I reached down and got Buck Grimes by the neck with my left hand, and I swung my right and hit Erath with it. But I had to lift Joe Ash clean off his feet and swing him around with the lick, because he wouldn't let go. So I only knocked Erath through the rail fence, which was around Uncle Saul's garden. About this time I found my left leg was free, and discovered that Buck Grimes was unconscious, so I let go of his neck and begun to kick around with my left leg, and it ain't my fault if the spur got tangled up in Uncle Jonathan Polk's whiskers and jerked most of them out by the root. I shaken Joe Ash off and taken the axe handle away from Pecos, cause I seen he was going to hurt somebody if he kept on swinging it around so reckless, and I don't know why he blames me because his skull got fractured when he hit that tree. He ought to look where he falls when he gets thrown across a cabin yard, and if Joel Gordon hadn't been so stubborn trying to gouge me, he wouldn't have got his leg broke neither. I was handicapped by not wanting to kill any of my kinfolks, but they was so mad they all wanted to kill me, so in spite of my carefulness the casualties was increasing at a rate which would have discouraged anybody but Bear Creek folks but they are the stubbornest people in the world. Three or four had got me around the legs again, refusing to be convinced that I couldn't be throwed that way, and Erath Elkins, having pulled himself out of the ruins of the fence, come charging back with his buoy. By this time I seen I'd have to use violence in spite of myself, so I grabbed Erath and squoze him with a grisly hug, and that was when he got them five ribs caved in, and he ain't spoke to me since. I never seen such a cuss for taking offense over trifles. For a matter of fact, if he hadn't been so bodaciously riled up, if he had kept his head like I did, he would have seen how kindly I felt toward him, even in the fever of that there battle. If I had dropped him underfoot, he might have been tromped on fatally for I was kicking folks right and left without caring where they fell, so I carefully flung Erath out of the range of that ruckus, and if he thinks I aimed him at Ozark Grimes and his pitchfork, well, I'd just never done it. It was Ozark's fault more than mine for toting that pitchfork, and it ought to be Ozark that Erath cusses when he starts to sit down these days. It was at that moment that somebody swung at me with an axe and ripped my ear nigh off of my head and I begun to lose my temper. Four or five other relatives was kicking and hitting and biting at me all at once, and they is a limit even to my timid manners and mild nature. I voiced my displeasure with a beller of wrath and lashed out with both fists, and my misguided relatives fell all over the yard like persimmons after a frost. I grabbed Joe Ash Grimes by the ankles and begun to knock them ill-advised idiots in the head with him, and the way he hollered, you'd a thought someone was manhandling him. The yard was beginning to look like a battlefield when the cabin door opened and a deluge of violent water descended on us. I got about a gallon down my neck but paid very little attention to it. However, the others ceased hostilities and started rolling on the ground and hollering and cussing, and Uncle Saul, 
riz up from amongst the ruins of Esau Grimes and Joel Braxton and bellered, Woman, what are you at? Aunt Zavala Garfield was standing in the doorway with a kettle in her hand, and she said, Will you idiot stop fighting? The Englishman's gone. He run out the back door when the fighting started, saddled his nag, and pulled out. Now will you born fool stop, or will I give you another deluge? Land save us? What's that light? Somebody was yelling toward the settlement, and I was aware of a peculiar glow which didn't come from such torches as was still burning. And here come Medina Kirby, one of Bill's gals, yelping like a Comanche. Our cabin's burning, she squalled. A stray bullet went through the window and busted Miss Margaret's aisle lamp. With a yell of dismay, I abandoned the fray and headed for Bill's cabin, followed by everybody which was able to follow me. They had been several wild shots fired during the melee, and one of them must have hived in Miss Margaret's window. The Kirbys had dragged most of their belongings into the yard, and some was bringing water from the creek, but the whole cabin was in a blaze by now. "'Where's Miss Margaret?' I roared. "'She must still be in there,' shrilled Miss Kirby. "'A beam fell and wedged her door so we couldn't open it, and—' I grabbed a blanket one of the gals had rescued and plunged it into the rain barrel, and run for Miss Margaret's room. There wasn't but one door in it which led into the main part of the cabin, and was jammed like they said and I knowed I couldn't never get my shoulders through either window, so I just put down my head and rammed the wall full force and knocked four or five logs out of place and made a hole big enough to go through. The room was so full of smoke I was nigh blinded, but I made out a figure fumbling at the window at the other side. A flaming beam fell out of the roof and broke across my head with a loud report and about a bucket full of coals rolled down the back of my neck, but I paid no heed. I charged through the smoke, nearly fracturing my shin on a bedstead or something, and enveloped the figure in the wet blanket and swept it up into my arms. It kicked wildly and fought, and though its voice was muffled in the blanket, I catched some words I never would have thought Miss Margaret would use, but I figured she was hysterical. She seemed to be wearing spurs, too, because I felt them every time she kicked. By this time the room was a perfect blaze, and the roof was fallen in, and we'd both been roasted if I'd tried to get back to the hole I knocked in the opposite wall. So I lowered my head and butted my way through the near wall, getting all my eyebrows and hair burnt off in the process, and come staggering through the ruins with my precious burden, and fell into the arms of my relatives, which was thronged outside. "'I've saved her,' I panted. "'Pull off the blanket. You're safe, Miss Margaret.' Ah, 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 said Miss Margaret, and Uncle Saul groped under the blanket and said, "'By golly, if this is the school teacher, she's growed a remarkable set of whiskers since I seen her last.' He yanked off the blanket to reveal the bewhiskered countenance of Uncle Jeppard Grimes. "'Hell's fire!' I bellered. "'What you doing here?' "'I was coming to join the lynching, you blame fool,' he snarled. "'I seen Bill's cabin was afire, so I clum in through the back window to save Miss Margaret. She was gone, but there was a note she left. I was fixing to climb out the window when this maniac grabbed me.' "'Give me that note,' I bellered, grabbing it. "'Medina, come here and read it for me.' "'That note run. "'Dear Breckenridge, I am sorry, "'but I can't stay on Bear Creek any longer. "'It was tough enough anyway, "'but being expected to marry you was the last straw. "'You've been very kind to me, "'but it would be too much like marrying a grizzly bear. "'Please forgive me. I am eloping with J. Pembroke Pemberton. We're going out the back window to avoid any trouble and ride away on his horse. Give my love to the children. We're going to Europe on our honeymoon. With love, Margaret Ashley. Now what you got to say, sneered Uncle Jeppard. I'm a victim of foreign entanglements, I said dazedly. I'm going to chaw Bill Glanton's ears off for saddling that critter on me. 
Then I'm going to lick me an Englishman if I have to go all the way to California to find one, which same is now my aim, object, and ambition. This Englishman took my girl and ruined my education and filled my neck and spine with burns and bruises. A uh, Elkins never forgets. And the next one that pokes his nose into the Bear Creek country had better be a fighting fool or a powerful fast runner. End of War on Bear Creek.